Hi, welcome to Mark Langley's Horsemanship Podcast, a podcast helping you to understand your horses in a calm, connected way. Mark, we're up in the top end of Australia, near Cairns, in a place called Melanda. It's humid, sweaty, very, very hot. The rest of Australia, or the southern end of Australia, is very, very cold right now. So we're up in the tropics, and you're up here to do some clinics and workshops in the top end, and then travelling all the way down through to Brisbane. So good to have you up this end of Australia. Yeah, it's great. It's great to come up this way. I have not done clinics up here before, but... uh... Yeah, it's uh, good, and we've got a few people have arrived already for the for the clinic tomorrow. So we're doing four days up here, and then I'm going to work my way down uh, through sort of you know the the sort of middle of not the middle of Queensland, so the um, up down the coast uh, to southeast Queensland, and then back home. Super. So we're going to kick off, Mark, with some questions from the members, as always. This week we've got some philosophical questions. So we're going to pick your brains on sort of just how you think about certain things. Um, I do like, I like these questions. I think they're, they're super interesting and they always sort of um, unravel a whole load of, of layers. The first one I'm going to hit you with is from Carla. And she says that she's noticed in your video library that sometimes you allow horses to circle you while standing still. And sometimes you back them up, ask to wait and be still. What are you looking for when you decide which tactic to use? And she's also just put in another question, which um, I know you said is really related to it. So we will include it in this as well, because it might make a little bit more sense to people. She said that when you've got a pushy or a hot horse that likes to be in front all the time, do you still use the technique of asking them to lead up in front of you or pass by? And what does it help with? So, Mark, I might just get you to explain that question a little bit more. I think you know what she means. Can you just explain it in the terms of what it is that's happening that leads to that question and, and then answer the question? Thank you, Mark. So, so I, guess, I guess what you mean is when you're leading your horse, do you allow your horse to lead ahead a little bit or do you, you, know, do you have it behind you? Um, and... Uh, I would say it depends when the horse or where the horse is at emotionally, you know, if it's ready to lead ahead or not. Um, that's, that's what, you know, so anyone who's leading their horse, whether it be on the left side or the right side, it's in relation to where that horse is travelling, whether it's beside, behind them on the ground, uh, beside them, in front of them. Um, but just in, in relation to the first bit that you asked, which is the leading around question, um, and the reason it's the same thing is because why do sometimes as I stop a horse and back them off and why do I ask them to lead around? Um, when a horse has a strong pushing forward thought when I'm leading a horse around me uh, to get it to start to circle, um, then I'll say, that's too much. You're not following a feel, you're just anticipating and marching forward. Uh, so if they march forward pushy and they're heavy and they've got a strong forward thought, then I'm gonna say no. Uh, follow the feel and, and because my hand is asking in a certain way to come forward and if I feel that horse overstepping over anticipating and pushing hard that's when I stop them but if they follow through nice and soft uh, then I allow them to walk through and the other thing is you'll feel the horses walk stiff and push in uh, they're like straightening and they're stiff as they walk past then I'll step them back and say soften up and walk by again until they take soft loose steps and their bodies a lot looser and they, they soften and walk around me. Um, it's a very tricky one because people think, oh, it's hard to see you know, from a distance what I'm trying to do there, but I can feel when a horse is just leaning and, and a horse is following nice and soft. So in, in that respect, going on to the, where a horse leads beside you, in front of you, and that sort of thing, is if the horse has got a strong forward pushing thought and it's pushing off uh, over the horizon or it's destinating, it's usually anxious and, and thinking way too far ahead. So what's happening there is the horses are not, not really connected with the environment, they're not connected with you. Uh, it's not got that nice uh, feeling of them being, um, you know, just aware of things that are going on around them. They're just sort of destinating. So those horses are just pulling off ahead of you um, as in they're, they're just marching off. So, so with those horses, I would say, can you lead behind softly um, and, and rate me a lot more? So to rate you, you might, if the horse's eye goes past your shoulder, you might just kind of do a half U-turn or turn your back on them and walk away off in a new direction. 
um, and, and every time their eye passes you, they're gonna to start to go, hang on a minute, I'm running late because they're walking off in a new direction. And when you walk on a, off in a new direction, sometimes you can say, well, hurry up a little bit, so they have to catch up, and it makes them think a little bit, and then and ultimately you're getting them to let go of that strong forward thought, okay? So the next thing is if they're really, really out there, then you can sort of pop a flag uh, to, to bring more awareness to you, you know? So if you see them just thinking off into the future, off onto the horizon, just shake the flag in the air, see if they can get let go of that strong forward thought. And um, yeah, and, um, and then once they're soft, but the horses that I want to lead ahead or the ones that I want to go out and explore are mostly the ones that are kind of very subdued and don't have a lot of confidence and they're just kind of, you know, just not a bright, they've just got hyper-focus on us, for instance, and they're just, um, you know, not letting go of us and they don't know how to lead out. They're the ones that I'm more inclined to let them lead out a bit more and, and explore and become a bit more confident at leading. But um, the ones that are super anxious and destinate, well, it's much better you get them centered first. Super, all right. I hope that helps answer that question. The next question is from Natalie. And Natalie says, what's your thoughts on things like sighing, snorting, yawning, lip licking, chewing, etc.? I was always taught it's a sign of relaxation because you can't do those things with your jaw tense. Is that the case? She's really interested to hear your thoughts. And I, I know I am on this one too. Please, Mark. Uh, all, those, all those things, especially those big yawn sighs that you see, licking and chewing and stuff, yes, most, most definitely I, I, would, I would agree with what, what you were originally told us. Uh, when horses carrying a lot of tension, a lot of tense, frozen, semi-frozen horses that you see, the ones that carry more anxiety and they have more freeze brace in them and stuff like that, they're the ones that when they do kind of let go of some of that tension, you see more extreme yawns and things like that and more big, the eye popping, the, uh, you'll see the whole face soften actually, you'll see them, sometimes their face looks kind of wrinkled and tight and you'll see a lot of those wrinkles loosen up and their face soften, eyes soften, all that sort of stuff. So, so yeah, and, and also, you know, uh, yeah, the, all that, you know, you, a horse with a quiet mind and a, and a sort of a, a good open horse is one that, what they're going to do is they're going to be very, um, they're going to be very, um, or less, you won't see as much of that sort of stuff. You'll see a lot more sniffing and things like that and um, just general interaction. Um, but the ones that are go like quite still and then there's quite a lot of, you know, lip movements and eye movements and, you know, as I say, the eye popping and the yawns and stuff like that, they're the ones that have let go of some tension for a moment and they, 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 they show all those signs. Um, but yeah, it's usually letting go of tension that you see a lot more of that and then um, if you're seeing it all the time um, then what's happening is your horse is still carrying probably too much tension in certain things and then it's releasing some of that tension but just because they've they've yawned uh, or they've had a stress yawn and they've done things like that it doesn't mean they're just on their way down to feeling good they've just may have it may be just a mind a, a, a bit of a release in tension for that moment uh, and I have seen horses go from releasing tension uh, back into tension, but I've also seen horses carrying hard thoughts, but they've released the brace tension through their face and they've actually had a lot of yawns and things like that, but they're still really hard in their eye and they've got a really hard thought. Um, so some horses have gone from frozen sort of nervous horses to actually I'm, I'm an expressive angry horse, um, but um, so they, so they've had all the yawns and all that sort of stuff, but as I say, they're still carrying um, emotional hard thoughts, yet they're not as tight. And, and I think the tension comes from more anxiety, um, but doesn't mean that they're soft. Um, okay, so what, what, just really quickly, can I butt in and ask what, what are you meant to do if you see your horse obviously have one of these relaxation signs or coming down signs? Um, are you meant to change what you're doing so that the horse can get into a better place? Well, yeah, but but sometimes you got to work out what the what has caused the anxiety, and that's the the thing is, you know, a lot of people, you know, sometimes come to clinics and they think, oh, I got want to relax my horse, and it's like, well, no, no, you don't want to relax your horse. You want your horse to regulate its anxiety better in an environment that it's, you know, so you've got to find the red flag and what causes the most anxiety, and what what is causing the horse to be like that, 
And then when you figure out what's, why the horse is like that, then you try and unlock that horse. And most times you unlock their thoughts, you get them to be able to think about what they're doing. And that's the first, um, you know, I'm not talking about what we have to do as people to be better people around our horses. Like sometimes we can just, you know, some people think just being soft and listening to our horse is gonna help them. Not necessarily if that horse has had past trauma in its life. So, so we have to get that horse to let go of whatever thought this is troubling it the most and open it up to searching and making some little decisions. And when you see a horse just let go of one thought, you'll see it have a eye pops, yawns, things like that. And then it's what they, what, like what you said, is what they do after that is, okay, what do we do after that? So when the horse lets go of a strong fixated thought, which is causing that freeze tension, then we got to say, okay, well, here's an opportunity to maybe follow me over here or sniff out to me. Or So we will give them something to do that actually continues their little journey of searching, making decisions for themselves. And some of those searchings will be searching towards us for connection. Some of it might be just searching towards another horse, sniffing a bit of manure on the ground. There's simple things like that that just help a horse come back into the land of the living and start to think through situations. It's really important. So interact a bit more. Okay. Yeah. All right, Mark. The next question is from Julia. She's actually on the clinic here. So woohoo. Hey, Julia. Um, she wants to know what's the best way to introduce horses, so new horses to each other, put them in the paddock and let them sort it out, or do you do a slow introduction? Um, it's, it's always hard. You can do slow introductions, but, but they're, they're going to be more in hand introductions where you, you sort of sometimes, if you've got a horse that's like it's very hard because you, 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 you in whatever you do you're risking horses so a slow introduction is sometimes what people do so they're less likely to risk the, the you know one of those horses so if if you if you're introducing a new horse that's never been introduced to horses before um what's going to happen is they don't know how to act very good around other horses and they're going to go in like a you know maybe a battering ram or you know oh, hey everybody and those horses might chase it off or turn and you know, kick out at it, whatever could happen. So then that horse is liable to get hurt or you get a very aggressive horse that just gets thrown in. So if, you, if, if um, so sometimes if there's two horses you want to get to know each other, sometimes I'll um, just have one on a long lead and if it gets a really strong, goes, goes with a really strong thought, as I'll say, let go of that thought and I'll get it to, I'll distract that thought. That thought might be going across to that horse and maybe having a bite at it or something like that. I'll say, let go of that thought and then I might offer it freedom to go again. Um, and when I see a horse going in a soft way of thinking, then I'll say, you know, um, uh, you know, I'll allow it to go and sniff that other horse and just start to sort of, you know, interact with that other horse. So the, in those situations, I'm doing, I'm doing it in that sense. If I've got a pony horse I'm riding, then I want to introduce it to a horse that I've got a lead off it. So I'm ponying a young horse. So I let those horses communicate but there's boundaries in that communication and any over aggression, any uh, strong, strong sort of pushy behavior, I sort of, I, I encourage them to let go of it. And then when they sort of went there, there by, by, by giving them each space and then I allow them to come back. And when, they, when they're soft towards each other, then I allow them interact. And that is interaction with boundaries. And you can do that in hand um, with two horses. Um, if you're good enough, you can have two horses, one in each hand, or you can have someone else with the other horse or something like that. So that's one way you can sort of start introducing horses to each other with, with certain boundaries. But if you're gonna do it out in a paddock, I, I, I kind of say just do it out in a big paddock where there's enough room. It's these small dinky little yards that horses get jammed up in corners with two horses on them and they can't get out and then they get hurt on a fence or get kicked or something like that. But when they've got space, in most instances, horses just say get away but if that horse is away from the herd they're not going to keep hounding it um, and usually it sometimes can take weeks to months for some horses to get amongst a herd or interact with uh, other horses but yeah so um, I still at home if I've got to just put a horse with a herd I can't go around and hand do it to every horse like so I'm going to put them with a herd and make sure they've got lots of space to be able to get out of the way and go and be on their own um, other situations I may there are other ways that you can um, I've seen many horses go on float trips together and get out at a, at a new place for a while and get very happy with each other like you know we sold a horse recently who she you know they, they brought a little pony up to be friends with her but she was like I don't want to know that pony I've, I've just 
come out of my herd and, and I don't want a bar of you. But after the float journey, they became good friends because basically she was taken away from a herd, put in a float with a horse she didn't know, and then that became her friend. So sometimes you can do things like that and then those horses interact very good after a float journey or something. But yeah, if you have to interact, interact them with a big herd, a lot of space and just let nature take its course, but monitor it, you know. If there's one uh, really, really aggressive, like especially if you've got one of those really culty geldings, but that one may not be the, the um, good, strong leader of the herd. It's just the one that seems to want to be like the stallion and it's really overwhelming. We can always take him out for a little while while you introduce that one with those other horses and, and, and let them be in there for a little while and see what happens with him out and then introduce him back in. Um, so he comes back in as the slightly new one after a few days. And that can also help if, if, if one of them's a, a, like a, a hunter that's just hunting and hunting relentlessly, um, then, then if that causes a problem, take him out, put, put the new one with the herd. And, and expect some running around, you know, don't be alarmed when they, uh, when you hear that thunder of feet, just take a deep breath, watch, 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 and maybe in half an hour, they might be sudden, all standing around grazing, who knows? Yeah, best to do it when they, when you know there's a bit of dry weather and there's, there's the, the ground's not greasy. You don't want a horse running up to a corner and slipping into a fence or something. But, but yeah, more space, most, most, most things are usually okay. It's only in tight spaces that you get the accidents. And some people try and do it over the fence, but um, apparently talking to a few vet nurses and vets over the years of doing clinics, I've heard that there are more horse accidents across fences than there are uh, internally in paddocks in with paddocks. horses. So, yeah. so, you know, people, I've, I... I Someone tried it over a fence one day and they, they, they told me what happened. It got, my course got hung up in the fence and, you know, even post and rail fences, they put their foot through and it's lots of damage can be done. So best off they have space and they can get out of the way and, and, um, and then they sort of slowly are allowed into a herd. That's usually what happens. Okay, and the final question for today is on float loading, a float loading question. It's from Tracy. She says that she's been working through your float loading training with her boys using your videos with Fern and it has opened her eyes. The horse that she's always considered a perfect traveler because he doesn't move around is in fact frozen in place. She has him going on and off easily and calmly, but once he's on, he closes in. His hooves are stuck with the strongest superglue in existence, she says. She can get him to reluctantly move backward and forward in the bay, but when she pushes him to the side to try and get him to rebalance, she can't get any movement whatsoever. So he's frozen. She now realises any tips for freeing up his feet and easing his anxiety and brace when he's in the bay. Okay, I'm going to give you a few little things that you can just go and muck around with. All of these things are going to be good for loading, but also good for all the other things that you're going to be doing with your horse. Um, chuck a set of long ropes, long reins on him uh, in a halter. Just do some of the exercises where I just walk around the horse, you know, close the reins around, stand behind the horse and just walk around in circles. So the horse is moving off the feel of the rein around its hindquarter a little bit. So the, the rein will just be above its hock and just get them to do nice tight circles around one way, around the other, get them to move, get them used to moving off the feel of very close boundaries. Put a breaching rope on your horse, like a, a ringed rope um, around um, below the tail, you know, somewhere where it just sits, you know, above its hocks, around its back end, from the, from, from the top of the tail down to its hocks somewhere, and just get it to lead forward off that, back into that pressure, lead forward off that, get it really loose at moving off all those pressures first when you're at the float find out where the worst part of the stiff the, 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 the freeze starts to set in you'll probably find the leading gets a little bit duller and duller as you're going in you'll probably find a certain way in you'll feel a change in your horse and you'll, you'll feel it if you really if you want to imagine well imagine I imagine sometimes and I try and get people to imagine this I'm just on a salt pan so you can imagine a salt pan where, where it's sort of you, you just it's just the flat ground and it's the same horizon everywhere so there is no float and for some reason you're just walking backwards and forwards or sorry you're you're rocking your horse backwards and forwards backwards and forwards and you walk back a bit rock your horse backwards and forwards backwards and forwards and all of a sudden your horse gets a bit sticky and you go why is the horse getting sticky there's a salt pan here um close your eyes while you're loading feel it you'll feel a change in your horse and it's at that point that you start to feel that first feeling of brace and that's where you back off that brace and you come forward until that brace there frees up. It has to same, it has to feel the same 
five meters outside the float. And if there's a point where it gets sticky, dull, uh, the horse is lagging, it's not stepping up soft in the hindquarter, chances are don't go any further. Well, chances are that that's where the horse is starting to freeze up a little bit. Don't go any further, fix the brace at that spot. When that brace is gone, go back and test it, go out and come back in. Oh good, that's gone there. And until you've led the horse all the way up into the chest bar and it's loose, you might be going backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards and think you're doing it okay. But if you're doing it to detail and the horse is leading to that detail, you'll feel that uh, you can feel brace set in as they're going in and they go from loose to kind of stiff. And uh, it, I, I, I bet it's start, he's starting to stiffen at a certain part going in. Imagine that's his first jump. When you feel the first brace, don't take him to the second jump until he's fixed on that first bit of brace. Then get him all the way in. The best thing you can also do is, is have the, the float open the first time. Take all the middle bits out, whatever you can, to make it as open as it can be. So you can move him around in there. So you can actually step his forequarter across with the lead rope and get him to sort of really move around in there backwards and forwards and then pull him across with the forequarter. If you've got him working real nice in the lead where you can pick up the knot and put a twist in it and he just rolls that hip out, then that's gonna really help you as well. So as you're loading him, you can do little hindquarter yields when he's, when he's near the ramp and on the ramp, where he steps over in his hind and he's got better movement in his hindquarter. And then when he's inside the float and there's more room around him, get him to walk on the floor and do all those sideways yields before you have him walking up beside the center divider. And then once, once he's walking real soft in there, then put the center divider in get him leading in and out with the center divider and see how you go. Um, and from there, you know, it's just a matter of working on it a lot. Um, and outside, you can start to push him across with your hands, on one hand on your hip and his ribs and move him over, get him really soft at that outside so he's aware that he can, so he's soft at that outside so you can also use that when you're inside the float. And just keep working on it um, because it's, it's gonna take him a little while to get better with that. Okay, and all those videos that he was referring to, Tracy, so there's a whole long reigning section on the online membership. There's a whole float loading section on the online membership. So that will cover your preparation for loading and it will cover how to check that they will travel safely. There's more videos um, outside of the Fern series. So once you go in that float loading, trailer loading section, you'll see a whole load of different work. And I know that Mark's been working on different horses as well and, and uh, does a whole load of stuff inside the float as well as outside. So that it'll all be there for you. So if anyone else is listening and they kind of want to look into this because float loading, trailer loading is a big deal when horses don't like it and we really need to help them with it. And um, so Mark's videos have, have been really good on this one. So it's all online. Just uh, Google Mark Langley Horsemanship and his membership will come up. So thanks very much for listening, all of you out there. And thanks to all the members who have put in all the questions and um, have a great week. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you.